Grab your diplomatic pouches, war gamers. The White Queen's War is evidently coming to a close. If you saw the last video, you probably know why. Just to refresh your memory, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you where things stand on the evening of February 26th. The Battle of Fenton Wood has just, it's not Woods, it's Fenton Wood, has just concluded. And let's take a look at that conclusion before we look at the overall regional and strategical map. On the right, you've got General Meltzer, the loser in the last battle. Look at the battlefield real quick. This becomes very important. As you recall, General... How can I not remember his name already? General Lackey, because I'm trying to keep track of a lot of different people at the same time. General Lackey effectively built a defensive line right here, sent a couple of cavalry around here, to scare these guys off and threaten this side. Now, G General Lackey knows about a ford right here that General Meltzer does not. A bit odd, given that this is inside Albin territory, but what you gonna do? This little extra cavalry came in and didn't have a whole lot of effect. Little miniature battle was fought here, didn't go the Albin's way. And that was kind of the, the, the critical node, the, the center of gravity. Losing that put a lot of pressure on General Meltzer's line. He was trying to establish a line here and link up with these reinforcements coming in here, but he just didn't have time to do that. It was too far to go. He didn't have a secured enough right flank. Sound familiar? And ultimately, at the end of the day, what really did him in was the dice rolls. He had a lot of... He rolled six to the Tenebrin one, or excuse me, he rolled ones to the Tenebrin sixes, and really, whatever your strategy is, it's really hard to overcome that kind of dice rolls. A lot of five to twos. A lot of close runs, too. So he lost by a total of six units destroyed to four over here. And then we look at the post-battle sequence, and a couple of things to be aware of. Well, I should actually point out a couple of mistakes that I made in running this battle. The I combined a couple of units here that I should not have. Uh, General Meltzer had actually left the Cliffrost and the Star Hill. I put a Cliff Hill into the battle. They should have been doing guard duty, so they got away with one there. Somehow I worked an extra heavy cavalry in there. I, I should have only had one Carassiers. I don't know why. Uh, I probably did something wrong on this side too, and ultimately at the end of the day, it's probably a wash for those mistakes, and I don't know that it made that big of a difference Let's chalk those up to the fog of war, shall we? What we're looking at is a post-battle sequence. And what we see here is that having lost six units, General Meltzer's forces were in some disarray. The real problem they have is that everybody had to fall back across this one bridge. And General, General Lackey here had a unit of heavy cavalry guarding that approach already. So everybody that's trying to retreat is being funneled through here. To make matters worse, these guys know about this ford, and they can send units over here to, again, cut them off. So as there's a big pile up here, they're getting hammered by heavy cavalry. They're seeing themselves be flanked all of a sudden. Utter disaster for the Albans. I don't see any way for them to come out. But just to run the numbers, what I did is I said, all right, we'll do what we do every time. And I said, look, they do have a pretty good cavalry force surviving. They've got, you know, the Dragoons and Carassiers were battered, but they're still around. They've got a, a Dragoons that were relatively fresh. So call that two light and one heavy. On the other side, General Lackey had that one heavy that was in the rear, uh, killing or searching for the Alban gear. And he had a couple of uh, crossiers that came in relatively fresh. Yeah, they took some damage, but, you know, they, they were still game fish. They had a fresh unit of Groon. So what I did is I said, look, I'm going to call it some disorder for the Albans. I'm going to call it a reasonable cavalry screen. However, there's a reasonable cavalry pursuit, and then I'm going to dock them a point because they don't have a clear line of retreat. All they have is one bridge that isn't even that secure. They can be flanked on this side. So altogether, you add those up, and what you find is you're at a minus three, and looking at Tony Bath's 
ancient wargaming, he says, at a minus three, you're going to lose 75% of your force. At a minus four, your force is destroyed. But given how battered these guys are, take a look at these numbers. This is what came into this fight. This was a last throw of the dice. The Silver Crossing Grenadiers came in at half strength. The Bridgeacre Dragoons came in at half strength. They were destroyed in the battle, which means they lost half of these, this number. And then another 75%. So they're down to about 190 from battlefield casualties. And then you chop that down to 50 Dragoons in the post uh, the retreat. These cannons ain't going nowhere, baby. These guys ain't going nowhere. Their boys are going to leave the cannons behind. So a pretty much a windfall for General Lackey. Now, his forces, he didn't have as many, but what he had was troops at, you know, maybe 80%, 75%, 70%, somewhere in there. You know, his artillery was pretty battered, but uh, they, didn't, they didn't do a whole lot. So he's going to be able to replace his losses, and his boys are going to have a good time we can take a look at the weather, see if that makes sense. We're you know, trying to help out the Albans here, trying to buy them anything, any kind of appreciation that we can. And what we find is on the, oh, it snows on the 27th. Well, I, I got to tell you, if it's that cold, that makes the river a done deal. I don't think that's, that's going to be a wash. Yeah, it's cold for the winners, but it's also cold for the losers who, uh, on the other hand, the only thing that they've got going for themselves is once they get across that bridge, since this battle was fought on the outskirts of Fairhold, any survivors can scramble back into the city walls of Fairhold and help hold the walls against a siege there in hopes that a relief force arrives. So General Meltzer, hey, good news, General Meltzer, you're the uncle of the White Queen, so you know, you're know you going to be able to make it back and you're going to get paid millions to write your memoirs and you're going to be able to, like my own American military advisors uh, in the 90s and early 2000s, who launched their careers in an unwinnable war, you're going to make a fortune telling people what they should do in the next war, despite the fact that you lost. Funny how that works, isn't it? That's all fake stuff, though. You can tell it's fake because it's real-world stuff. Let's talk about the important things, and that means talking about what's going on on the table. So... Relief Force, Fairhold, major city. This is a foundry. It's, it's a C-class city. These guys ain't no slouch. The Queen ain't going to want to lose that, but it's invested by Lackey's 3,200-point now invading army. Tenebrans, remember, were the defenders here. White Queen wanted to take Grand Point. Just wasn't going to happen. She went two and, or one and two up here, and she went one and one down here. But that one, baby, oh, what a defeat that was. So what we're looking at is General... Uh, after the Battle of Humbratos Bridge, General... Oh, I didn't write his name down here. This is General Typhonus. Is now sitting pretty in Sun Harbor. It's a little little coastal village, you know, under siege, but they can supply by water, so maybe that's okay. He's got a 47 AP army. Not bad. General Lackey's still sitting on a 32 AP army. That's who's attacking Fairhold. The relief force is General Irwin who was retreating north after having been beaten at the Battle of Humbratos Bridge. So what you're looking at here is a total of 80 AP to 25. He's outnumbered 3 to 1. All right, well, what other forces does she have? Remember, General Greenwood is sitting up here on the border by Thornhold, just, just waiting, just hanging out, swapping bottles of wine with General Semperatus, who's hanging out in the capital of Umbrostra, and uh, waiting for his chance to do some good, but it's not going to happen. All he can do is keep General Thorn, uh, General Greenwood up here honest. And anyway, even if you wanted to bring General Greenwood into position, you're looking at a weeks-long journey down to Oakenscar. So that's not going to be much of a factor. Maybe you bring him back down to the river so you can float him down to defend Albanopolis if Typhonus decides, hey... Maybe Lackey goes down and beats up General Irwin. Maybe Typhonus leads siege to Albanopolis. Or maybe the White Queen throws in the towel. Maybe because she has lost most of her forces. She started out with something like 150. She's down to 50 AP. That was more than it. It was like 170 AP. You know what we could do? This is, of course, my Wargaming Journal. I've got notes on everything. We can actually go back and take a look. 
when things started, she had uh, 55, 61, so that's 126, 154. Yeah, 154 AP. She's down to 50. On the other side of the ledger, you're looking at uh, 127, who is still sitting on 107. So once you factor in all the prisoners and all of the losses, when the wounded come back, that's the other thing you can look at, General Lackey, because he only lost one battle. He's going to be getting some forces back here in uh, about a week. Uh, these guys actually came back for the battle. So, ultimately, I don't think there's any question at all but that the White Queen's venture to take Grand Point failed. And as you look at this map, I think it becomes pretty obvious why it failed. If you look at the difference in the road networks, the Tenebrans have their center river, which allows for rapid movement north to south. But they also have a secondary route. And everything kind of... They've got a much better flow towards the front from these outlying districts. And they've got a, they just have a better network. On the other hand, you look at the White Queen's network, and she's got a river here, but it's largely cut off by unimproved roads. Sweetheart, if you want to defend this frontier, you're going to have to invest in some pavement. Bridge Acre, maybe down to here? You know, this, this slugging across unimproved roads just ain't cutting it. Maybe even build a road from Sun Harbor to Might Reach, but I don't know if you're going to want to do that. Because as I look at this, the fact that uh, if you tally it up, there's almost a two-to-one advantage in prisoners between Tenebra and Alba. Tenebra's got like two or three prisoners to every one that the Albans hold. So once you do a one-for-one -one swap, they're still going to have something like 1,500 to 2,000 men that they either sell into slavery. They're not going to do that. This is, uh, this, like, this is a Napoleonic era. It's largely, uh, we're using a European flavor to this. So what is, are the diplomats going to decide? And I think as the diplomats meet and try to hammer this out, that what is going to happen is the White Queen is going to lose Fairhold and Might Reach. Ultimately, she'll lose Fairhold because Lackey is going to besiege that. And Lackey's probably going to start moving his, his guys in to uh, colonize Fairhold. And then Might Reach is connected to Fairhold. It's a short walk back and forth. So eventually Might Reach is really dialed more into Fairhold. And I really think that the result of the White Queen's War is going to be a redrawing of the borders like so. And all of those ethnic Albans that were ho living in Grand Point that were hoping to become part of the motherland once again are actually going to be buried deeper inside the greater Tenebra nation. So that's really where things stand here as we turn the calendar from February to March. And all of these negotiations are going to take time, right? We're going to be well into the summer, both in calendar and in the real calendar. Uh, this is expected to go live sometime late May, early June. It'll probably be late May, early June in FO 1802. Is it 1802? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because the uh, first elopation where we started that one in 1801, this one started in 1802. And getting back to the first elopation war, the Sinestrans and the Dextrans up there, I still haven't resolved what's going on with the Red Queen. I need to paint up some pirate miniatures. I do have the pirates' adversaries all painted up. We're ready to go with that. Maybe need to put slap together a couple of little boats that we can do. But I think that what's going to happen is old red-handed Helen is going to take sympathy. You know, that traveling uh, sisterhood of the Yaya pants or whatever, that, that whole sister thing where women kind of take care of each other. I think that's going to come into play and she's going to do what she can. The other thing that I'm going to factor in, and this is a real world thing, I have a green army. I mean, my miniatures are green. And I want it, so I've got room for one more nation. And after thinking about this for a while, probably going to put a long, thin nation over here to kind of cap off this subcontinent. So you're going to wind up with a total of one, two, three, four, and then five nations along here. Because it's thin, it'll be a seaborne power. And I don't know what's going to happen. It could be that Red Handed Helen uses her fortune and she gains something from uh, the White Queen. And she manages to take over or influence. Maybe she marries the prince regent of whatever this green nation is over here. 
and then decides, yeah, you know what, we're going to go ahead and ally with the Albans, and we're going to send armies across the border this way. You know, we'll connect them with these cities. And now the Tenebrans are probably going to have to call on one of their neighbors to the north to be their ally to put pressure coming down this way. And we're going to see some more terrain effects as the the links between, I mean, I know where this goes. This goes to Basin Hill. Uh, it's cut off, but this goes, I know where this road leads. I know where these lead to both roads both lead to Talberg. So depending on whether it's the Sinistrans or the Dextrans, that's going to radically shape how that campaign goes. If the Sinistrians decide to stay neutral, then you could conceivably see these two nations, um, you could see uh, something where the Tenebrans are caught between, and then we see a flanking force, and the White Queen has to run up this way. We may add some improvements. We may add some fortresses. I may go ahead and just... Yeah, the Queen's not stupid, right? She's going to go ahead and connect and improve this road right here over the course of the summer so that when it comes time to launch her next offensive, hey, she's got an easier route into this area. Maybe she maybe she will, you know, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, maybe she'll, she'll found another town or city right there. So that, or right here, so that Star Hill blossoms from just a sleepy little crossroads town into a full-fledged C-class city of its own. We'll make some changes to kind of freshen it up and reflect the passage of time and also give ourselves some more challenges. That is also important. Not so much to cheat in favor of one guy or the other, but just to see what happens. Uh, and I think, really, that's probably about all we have to say on the issue today. So I'd like to thank all of our commenters who uh, gladly, willingly, and, well, actually, without permission even let me uh use their names as generals uh, for the record general lackey is the big winner with two significant victories under his belt melter did the best he could with what he had let's blame the troops let's blame the weather let's blame it blame anything but him uh let's blame me right i'm still learning and then of course we've got generals typhonis and Irwin down here in the south who mixed it up pretty good no hard feeling guys thanks for participating thanks for following along we're going to set aside the big campaigns and I may even just go ahead and run a medieval next. Hard to say. There's only one way to find... Well, that's not true, is there? Actually, two ways to find out. One is to track me down over on the Twitter machine and see what I'm shooting my mouth off about over there. I post little previews. Just, hey, this is what I painted. Gives you an idea what's coming. And, of course, you can check out War in a Box. That's all one word. At blogspot.com is in, you know... A war in a box at blogspot.com. I post things there too, so even though I'm recording these six weeks ahead of time, anywhere from two to six weeks ahead of time, you can get a feeling for where things are going. But I'll say this. One last thought in conclusion. I am going to hold off on more black powder campaigning because as I record this, I've still got a long way to go before you see this, and I want to know what you guys think. I want to hear some suggestions from you. What do you think would be far more interesting? Would it be more interesting to just go ahead and draw the coastline up here and make that green nation an island nation? I don't know. You, do, I'm, I'm disinclined to do that because I'm not a naval guy, and I don't want to do too much boat stuff. Boats are very scary to me, at least from a wargaming perspective. So tell me what you think of this campaign. You know, What lessons are we taking away? What can we do to improve it in the next time? And I'm all ears. Can't guarantee I'll take your suggestions, but I'm absolutely going to read them all. Thanks again for coming along. Until next time, I'm praying for you.